police reporter brings you another true story of crime and its detection. On January 1st, 1911, the New York Tribune carried a story which began with the following headline. Die with the old year. Maryland couple take cyanide of potassium on eve of marriage. Chatted merrily together before death. He had bought wedding new rings. Now this case would have gone down in history as a double suicide if the coroner had not been puzzled about several features of the case. So, he called for an investigation. Mrs. E. Lawser, as you know, we are investigating the strange death of your daughter, Gracie Lawser, and her fiancé, Charles Edward Twigg. Yes, Dr. Ford. I'd like you to tell this jury just what happened on that day. Well, a little after 11 in the morning, Charles telephoned that he was in town and that he would come over to the house at about 2 o'clock. When Grace heard this, she went up to her room and started primping. At almost exactly 2 o'clock, the front doorbell rang. <coughs> oh, come in, Charles. Hello, Mrs. Alassa. Where's Grace? Isn't she at home? Of course. She'll be here directly. Uh, oh, oh, Grace! Yes, Mother? It's Charles. I'm coming. She's been upstairs primping ever since you telephoned. Hello, darling. Well, it's about time you came to see me. Did you miss me? Of course I did. Once a week isn't enough for a fellow to call on his best girl. Well, I've got to sort of get things straightened around for a honeymoon. You don't want our business, any business on my mind when we go off on our trip. Uh, why don't you two go into the parlor and I'll bring you some uh, fruitcake and a glass of wine. Thanks, Mrs. Alasser. Still calling me Mrs. Elasser, eh? Oh, I'll be calling you mother as soon as we get back from our trip. Well, you could be a little more familiar, even, even if I am going to be your mother-in-law. I'll be back in a minute. Come on in the parlor, Charles. Okay. Oh, it's chilly in here, isn't it? I light the gas fire. Do you realize it's less than a week before we'll be married? Do I? I don't ever forget it. A week can seem like an awful long time, can't it? Yes. And this time next Thursday, we'll be on our honeymoon. I've already bought the tickets. Have you? Where are we going? Just where you said, Florida. Will you like that? I'll love it. Just think, Charles. A honeymoon away from the cold and the snow. Being down there where there's sunshine and palms. It's just too romantic for anything. A honeymoon should be romantic, darling. And we will be happy, won't we? Of course we will. How can we help it? Gracie, I bought it. Bought what? What we were looking at in Townsend's window. The wedding ring? The white one with all the little diamonds in it? That's it. Oh, let me see it. Sure. I hope it fits. There she is. Oh, it's beautiful. It looks even better than it did in the window. Let me try it on. They say it's bad luck. Oh, you and your superstition. What could happen to it? Nothing, I guess. Oh, sure. What's the matter? It doesn't fit. Oh, I'll tend to that. Townsend said if it was too small, he'd make it fit. Well, did you two think I was never coming? Oh, we forgot all about the wine and cake. Charles? Thank you, Mrs. Alasa. Gracie? Thanks, Mother. Did you bring any for yourself? Oh, I haven't time to sit around and eat cake and drink wine. Oh, Mother, you haven't anything to do. Well, it seems sort of sinful to drink wine in the afternoon. You're too old-fashioned, Mrs. Alasa. Oh, I know, but I can't help it. Oh, but don't let me keep you two from enjoying yourselves. Oh, Gracie... What's that you have there? <laughs> My wedding ring. Want to see it? Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, your father never gave me such a fancy ring. But we managed to make our marriage last in spite of it. And I hope Gracie and I are as happy as you two have been. Well, I don't often talk about it. But I can't wish you any better luck than we've had. Gracie will make you a good wife, I know. Better than I deserve, I reckon. Oh, I don't know. You're not a bad boy. Oh, well, here I am talking, and I know you two want to be alone. Well, let's make it a toast. You propose it. All right. Here's to our future together. May it be long and prosperous. Mmm, that's good. Say, we forgot the one about all our troubles being little ones. <laughs> oh, you. Oh, uh, excuse me. Are you sleepy? Uh, sort of. One little glass of wine, and you want to go to sleep. Must be the heat from that stove. No excuses. That's a nice way to act when you come over to see me. Oh, <laughs> you're just as bad as I you am. Must be catching. Grace? Yes, Mother, come in. What is it? Oh, well, the dressmaker wants to know uh, when you can come over for a fitting. Oh, tell her I'll be there at half past four. I'll tell her, darling. Let you know when it's time to go over. 
And uh, then what happened, Mrs. Elosser? I didn't go near the room again until nearly half past four. I knocked on the door, but no one answered. So I went into the room. They were still sitting on the sofa like they were asleep. I crossed the room to wake Gracie and saw something was wrong. When I touched them, I knew they were dead. Then I ran into the street and screamed for help. And you found nothing in the room which could have contained poison? No. No glasses, no bottles, nothing. Thank you, Mrs. Elosser. That'll be all. Now I'd like to call Harlan Norris. Are you here, Harlan? Yes, sir. Uh, Harlan, can you tell me the same story that you told your mother this morning? Yes, sir. Do you know Mrs. Elosser? Yes, sir. We live right down the street from the Elossers. Uh, have you ever been in their house? No, sir. Uh, now, Harlan, you tell us just what you saw in that afternoon. Well, Mama sent me down the store to get a bar of soap, and I was on my way back. Just as I came to the Elossers' house, Mrs. Elossers came running out screaming for help. Yes, uh, we know. Mrs. Elossers told us that. Uh, but then what happened? When she got to the sidewalk, she sort of looked around, kind of dazed-like, and went back in the house. Uh, what did you do then? I thought there might be something wrong, so I sneaked up, sneaked up to the window and peeked in. And uh, what did you see, Harlan? I saw a man and a woman sitting on the sofa and not moving. Who were they? Didn't know the man. The woman was Grace Elizer. Uh Then what happened? Mrs. Elizer came into the room. What did uh, she do? She went over to the man took a glass out of his hand, and then she took a glass out of Grace Elizer's hand. Is that all? No, sir. She picked the little green bottle off the floor and took the two glasses and the bottle out of the room. Would you know the glasses again if you saw them? Yes, sir, I think so. Well, see if you can pick out the glasses from these here on my table. There's two green glasses like these. Thank you, Harlan. That's all. The glasses that Harlan picked were the only two glasses on my table that were taken from the Elosser home. The child is lying. Nothing like that ever happened. It seems very significant that this child who has never been in your home should be able to pick out your glasses so easily. Oh, I don't care what you think. The boy is mistaken. These are ordinary glasses that can be bought in any store in Cumberland. Quiet, quiet. Oh, I don't know what you're driving at, but I won't have any 12-year-old boy accuse me of lying. Inasmuch as this investigation has taken such an unusual turn, I move that it be adjourned until a week from today so that we may sift the evidence we have heard. This court is dismissed until that date. About three days later, the coroner called on Mrs. Elosser at her home. Uh, Mrs. Elosser, this whole thing is such a strange muddle, I thought I'd come over and talk to you privately about it. Well, if you've come over to get me to confess to murdering my own daughter and Charlie Twig, you're insane. Oh, that isn't the reason I've come at all. Don't you think I hear what people are saying? Don't you think I know what's going on? Everyone, everywhere, looks at me as though I were a murderer. And what you said at the inquest started it all. Well, that's what I've come over to clear up. Do you think I killed those two young people? Well, I admit I thought it might be a possibility. But since I had a little private talk with Harlan Norris this afternoon, I've changed my mind. You had a quarrel with his mother, didn't you? Yes, some years ago. He admitted that part of the story wasn't true. That he'd been coached in it by his mother. This, of course, throws the boy out as a witness. I'm sure now that you had nothing whatever to do with it. But I'd like to prove it. How do you expect to prove it by me? I've told you everything. I don't know anymore. Well, I've given this thing a lot of thought, and if you don't mind, I'd like to try an experiment. What kind of an experiment? An experiment that will prove just how these two young people met their death. Would you object to that, Mrs. Elosser? Well, of course not. I'm more interested in proving it than you are. Well, then we'll go into the room where you found them. Well, it's just across the hall. And then we'll prove it one way or another right now. Uh, uh, this is the room. Uh, wait till I bring my basket. What have you got in there? Two cats. Black cats. Two black cats? Yes. I'd like to leave them in the room under the same conditions that your daughter and her fiancé were found that afternoon and for the same length of time. Oh, I see. Now, uh, where did you find their bodies? Uh, on that sofa. Come on, kittens. You'll have to lie on that sofa in the interest of science. Uh, now, Mrs. Elosser, were the windows open or closed? Closed. And uh, the doors? They were closed, too. Is there anything else that's different from what it is now? Uh, yes, uh, th the gas grate was going. Well, I'll light it then. Now, uh, is that all? Oh, I think so. Well, then we'll go out of here. How long was it before you found them? 
Uh, almost three hours. Then we'll sit down and wait for three hours. One hour. Two hours. Three hours past. Well, I guess the three hours are up. Do you want to come in with me? Uh, certainly. Well, then leave the door open, and I'll go in and open the window. Don't come in until I get the window open. Is it all right now? Yes, come on in. And take a look at those cats. Why, they're dead. The cats are dead. They look as if they, they died in their sleep. What killed them? The same thing that killed your daughter and Charles Twigg. Carbon monoxide gas. Where did it come from? The gas stove. And next week at the investigation, the jury will bring in a verdict of death by accident. And so one of the most baffling mysteries that ever monopolized the breakfast conversation in Cumberland, Maryland, was solved. You have just heard another true mystery brought to you by the police reporter. This is a radio release production. <laughs>